Welcome to the second talk of uh, part two of ICU Linguistic Colloquium. The second speaker, uh, Hiroaki Saito, will be introduced by Tomoyu Tomoyuki Yoshida Sensei. Okay, I, I'm Tomoyuki Yoshida from ICU. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you all uh, Hiroaki Saito, an ICU graduate, uh, also. Um, He's current, currently at the Mie University as a specially appointed associate professor. Um, he, um, Hiroaki graduated from ICU in uh, 2014, and he went on to graduate school uh, at the uh, University of Connecticut. And uh, his most recent publication includes uh, grammaticalization as uh, decategorization appeared uh, this year uh, in Journal of Historical Syntax. He's got numerous uh, presentations and publications in the, in the conferences, uh, major conferences, uh, such as uh, WAFO, WICFO, uh, CLS, and JK conference. His talk today is uh, decategorizing say. Uh, it's gonna be interesting. Go ahead, Hiroaki. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here, even though it's virtual. Okay, let me share the slide. Okay. All right. Can everybody see the slide? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, grammaticalization, focusing on the change with speech verbs. So grammaticalization is one of the most well-studied topics, not only descriptive or traditional linguistic, linguistics, but also in diachronic generative syntax, including Roberts and Russell or Van Gelderen's work. And while a wide range of grammaticalization phenomena have been studied in generative grammar, there is no detailed analysis of grammaticalization of speech verbs, even though the change with speech verbs is one of the most sort of well-attested patterns in a number of unrelated languages. And it's also one of the most well-studied topics in traditional or descriptive grammar. So this is gonna be the focus of the, today's talk. So let me introduce a sort of a simple example of the change with speech verbs. That's the change from a speech verb to a complementizer. For example, in Tukan Besi, which is an Austronesian language, uh, kwa was originally a speech verb, but it has become a complementizer co-occurring with a uh, matrix predicate say. So in one, you can see kwa, this guy was a speech verb, but now uh, in the current modern Tukan Besi, this is a complementizer and it co-occurs with the matrix verb say. So this talk aims to offer a formal generative style analysis of grammaticalization, focusing on the change with speech verbs, like I said. Assuming that speech verbs consist of category neutral roots and the verbalizer category determining head, I will suggest uh, grammaticalization of speech verbs involves the loss of the verbalizer component. And I'll show that the proposed analysis makes a different prediction regarding possible stages or patterns of grammaticalization from other generative analysis, which I argue is desirable. Specifically, I'm gonna look at evidential markers which have developed from the speech verbs and indexical shift operators. Here's an overview of the talk. In the next section, I'm gonna show you the gist of the proposal and provide uh, possible stages of the grammaticalization in question under the proposed analysis. I'll then discuss those possible stages in more detail with examples in the following section. Then I conclude the presentation. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna introduce you the gist of the proposal. So like I said, the most common pattern of the grammaticalization of speech verbs is a change from a speech verb to a complementizer. So I just repeated the qua, uh, qua example here. So descriptively speaking, the change found here is a case where a speech verb has become a complementizer 
keeping its phonological shape the same. In other words, while the categorical status of the original speech verb has changed, its phonological information has not. To capture this observation, I assume speech verbs or maybe verbs in general consist of at least two components. One is a root, which is an a categorical component that encodes their phonological and semantic information. And the verbalizer component, V. So under this assumption, the regular speech verbs have the following structure, as you can see in two. So this is given in the head final structure, but the head directionality is not relevant here. In two, the category neutral root say here, this guy merges with V category determining head. Then this root say obtains its verbal status. And assuming the separation of, uh, between roots and category determining heads, I suggest grammaticalization of speech verbs involves loss of the verbalizer layer, like three. And I'm gonna refer to this change as decategorization. Please note that the term decategorization is used as a descriptive term for the change here. So I'm not arguing for a syntactic or morphological operation that would delete a categorizer or anything like that. I'll later discuss how the relevant change could happen here in terms of the motivation for the change. Okay. So in three, due to the absence of a category determining head, the root say can't obtain a verbal status. So however, the root say is still syntactically present. Therefore, if the only change involved here is the loss of V, we would expect that the bare or free root say should retain at least part of its phonological and semantic information as well as its syntactic properties. I'm gonna discuss this point in more detail in the next section. And under the current analysis, uh, we make a novel prediction regarding possible patterns or stages of the grammaticalization in question. So that's the new point about the current approach. So under the standard generative analysis, the grammaticalization from a speech verb to a complementizer involves a reanalysis of the verb say as a complementizer, as you can see in four. Here, we would expect two stages of the change. So in the first stage for A, sorry, for one, the say here is a regular speech verb, of course. And here the speech verb say can be seen as sort of the combination of the root say and the verbalizer V. And the second stage for two, it has been reanalyzed as a complementizer while its phonological shape remains the same, which is indicated by a C say. So the complementizer is the pronunciation say. So this is sort of the standard generative approach. On the other hand, under the current approach, we would predict an additional intermediate stage here where the bare root say is present without little v, the verbalizer layer. So first of all, the first stage 5.1 and, oh, sorry, this should be 5.3, and the uh, five three correspond to the four A and four two here under the standard analysis. So what's important for us is five two given in red. Here the speech verb, that namely the combination of the root say and the verbalizer is reanalyzed as a bare root decategorization. And the second stage which involves a bare root is the stage that does not follow under other generative analysis without additional assumptions. Just to clarify, what's new with the current analysis is this particular intermediate stage where a bare root exists. Okay. So before proceeding to the next section, let's consider what would motivate the change here. So here, I follow Klamer and Roberts and Wasser in assuming that reanalysis triggering language change is motivated by the preference for simpler structure. Namely, 
when an input to which language acquirers are exposed is structurally ambiguous for them, they're going to prefer the simpler one. So returning to the change with speech verbs, uh, if an original input to language acquirers, which is intended to have the structure in 5.1, is ambiguous for them to uh, between the structure in 5.1 and the one in 5.2, the latter is preferred because the regular speech verb involves the say root plus the verbalizer, while the only bare root is present in 5.2. The same falls for the change from 5.1 to 5.3 or 5.2 to 5.3 because uh, the 5.3 involves fewer heads or a simpler structure. I'm going to talk about, again, this point with concrete example in the following section. But please notice that uh, there could be, actually, there may well be other factors involved here that would motivate the change or reanalysis. For example, it's been claimed that frequency might play a role here. I'm going to put aside this issue in this talk. All right, so let's look at the three stages in more detail. So I'm going to show items of all of these three stages, five, one through three, are attested in unrelated languages. What's important for us is that there are elements belonging to the stage two, five, two here which is straightforwardly predicted to exist under the proposed analysis, the bare root stage. OK, first of all, let's look at the first stage, 5.1. So the first stage of the grammaticalization of, sp of speech verbs is, I mean, of course, speech verbs, verbs of saying. For example, like I said in the very beginning of the presentation, a kwa in Tukabesi was originally a speech verb even though this usage is now obsolete. So in this language, you can't use qua as a verb anymore. Another interesting case is found in languages like Taiwanese. Kong in Taiwanese works as a verb of saying. So in six, ahui, kong, as in is not coming. Here, kong works as a regular say. And in addition to this, kong, also has a grammaticalized usage as a complementizer. So in this language, unlike Tukambesi, kong can work as a verb and a complementizer. In seven, uh, ahui think kong as in is not coming. So here, kong co-occurs with uh, another matrix, sorry, a matrix predicate as a complementizer. And in addition to regular speech verbs like kong, or the pre-modern qua, I suggest there are elements which look like a complementizer, but actually involve a fully verbal structure. That is Japanese to you. And eight is a sort of a typical complex end piece in Japanese, jonga meari o skida toyu uwasa, where you have an embedded clause and you have toyu, then you have the head noun rumor. Here, toyu, appears between the, between the head noun, rumor, and the clause that describe the content of the head noun, namely, John likes Mary. Here, to, to you appears to be located in the complement type position in pure one known relative complex and, and piece, as schematically shown in nine. So you have a clause, then you have to you, then you have the head noun. So consequently, to you has been typically assumed to be a complementizer the head of C, in pure complex NPs since Kuno and Nakao. That's shown in 10, where Toyu works as the head of the embedded CP. However, contrary to this standard assumption, Son suggests that Toyu is not a simple complementizer, but rather has more complex structure. So Toyu consists of the unmarked complementizer To in Japanese, and the speech verb say you. Under this analysis, complex nouns like eight, the rumor that John likes Mary, would involve a relative clause rather than a closer complement of the head noun that's shown in 11. So you have the head noun here, 
this head noun is modified by the relative clause. So it's interpreted as the rumor, which says that John likes Mary. And there are actually supporting pieces of evidence for this analysis. The first one comes from the past version of Toyu. So with Toyu as a speech verb, you part can have the past inflection ta. So as we saw, you can say John ga meari o suki da to iu uwasa. That's fine, but it's also fine to say John ga meari o suki da to itta uwasa. So here you have ta inflection, the past inflection on the iu part, the say part. And previously, I took this fact to indicate toyu and toitta involve at least uh, V and T layers. And if this analysis of toyu is on the right track, the apparent complementizer toyu, in fact, involves a speech verb syntactically. But still, it is worth noting that toyu has been assumed to be a complementizer due to its distribution. Namely, it appears in the canonical C position. So in fact, this distributional property of toyu seems to have facilitated semantic bleaching of speech verb iu in terms of semantic selection. So usually, the verb iu, say, requires a human subject. You taking a non-human subject yells infelicity, since no human subject can't make an utterance. So in Japanese, it's weird to say the rumor says was said that John likes Mary. However, uh, as we've already seen, this semantic requirement of you is bleached in complex NPs. So as we already seen here, it's fine to say the rumor which says that John likes Mary. Therefore, it seems that Toyu in Japanese is currently in the process of grammaticalization. It has a fully verbal structure syntactically in that it introduces the external argument via little v, the verbalizer, but it also exhibits bleached semantics in terms of semantic selection in that it does not require a human subject, only in complex NPs. To sum up, I, we've seen concrete examples of the items in the first stage, 5.1. I suggested that in addition to regular speech verbs, Japanese toyu, which looks like a complementizer, but actually involves a fully verbal structure. So syntactically, it belongs to the first stage currently. OK. So let's move on to the next stage, stage two. It is crucial for us to show there are items in this stage because the existence of this stage is predicted under the proposed analysis, while it seems difficult without additional assumptions to capture it under the standard analysis, like Roberts and Rosso or Van Gelderen. So this is the stage where the bare say root is present without the verbalizer. Uh, before, concrete, uh, before discussing concrete examples, let us consider what kind of element we would expect to find in this stage. So here, the root say can't be verbal due to the absence of the category determining head. I suggest this decategorization is the responsible for a particular type of semantic bleaching. So if we assume little v, the verbalizer layer, layer introduces the external argument, the loss of v means the loss of external argument. Now, in fact, the loss of the external argument has been independently claim to play a crucial role in the grammaticalization of speech verbs. So under the current analysis, uh, the loss of the external argument follows from the loss of V without possessing any special semantic bleaching rules or processes. Also, if the only change involved here is the loss of V, the root say should retain at least part of its phonological and semantic properties, as well as its syntactic selection property. Informally put, what we would get here is nonverbal elements, which still have a say-like pronunciation and interpretation, as the root say keeps its phonological and semantic information. So what's say-like pronunciation and interpretation? 
what we would expect is that on the phonology side, as the say root encodes relevant phonological information, namely the pronunciation as say, decategorized say should still be pronounced say or pronounced like say. On the semantic side, I assume the root say encodes at least information of saying or speech and the attitude of the, of the speech or the speaker and some accessibility relation between the world of evaluation and possible words or maybe relations among situations or contexts. Also, syntactically speaking, if the root say retains its selectional property, the root say should select a CP complement. In other words, it should be located above CP. So in the following, I'm gonna argue there are elements which belong to this stage. In other words, stage two items exist. Specifically, I'll suggest evidential markers that have developed from a speech verbs and operators which induce indexical shift are in this intermediate stage where a bare say root is present. So what I'm gonna show is that these elements are non-verbal but still have a say-like pronunciation and interpretation. So let's look at evidentials first. In many languages, gram grammaticalized say functions as an evidential marker. One example comes from Lesgian, Northeast Caucasian language, Luda. This guy comes from uh, Luhuda, says, and Luda marks hearsay evidentiality in this language. So if you say, today we'll have a meeting, Luda, this means they say there will be a meeting today. Even though the Luda comes from a speech verb, uh, now the status of Luda is not verbal. So you can actually confirm the nonverbal status of Luda. For example, you can't have an aspect or tense marker on Luda, which is usually required for lesbian verbs. But Luda is still interpreted as meaning that somebody made the relevant utterance. So the saying meaning is retained here. Yes, like I said, uh, while this kind of evidential marker has been grammaticalized as is no longer verbal, it still signals there was or there is a speech event marking hearsay evidentiality. Also, it is pronounced like the original speech verb. So what you have here is say like pronunciation and interpretation. I argue that say, such evidential markers are in this intermediate stage 5.2 where the root say is present without little v. These evidential markers have a say-like pronunciation and interpretation due to the root say. On the phonology side, the root say encodes the phonological information of original speech verb so the derived evidentials are pronounced like the original speech verb. On the semantic side, as the root say encodes the information of a speech event, this kind of elements marks hearsay evidentiality. And in fact, cross-linguistically, speech verbs are a common source of evidentials, especially hearsay evidentials, marking reported information. And there is another type of grammaticalized evidentials. So far, we have evidentials that have developed from a speech verb, here, we're going to look at those which have come from the combination of a speech verb and a complementizer. For example, in Colombian Spanish, you have this guy, disque. Uh, this comes from diseque, says that. And disque, as a word, as one word, marks hearsay evidentiality. So if you say, as in 16, disque, this is going to be great. This means this is going to be great, they say. And despite the fact this case comes from the combination of say and see, this case has been fully grammaticalized as it, as it's no longer verbal. On the phonology side, it has undergone reduction, phonological erosion. For example, the change, change from this case to this case involves the apocopy of the verbal form and the complementizer has been fused with the verbal form. And morphosyntactically, the form of this is invariable. 
and you can't inflect this, the verb part. So if you try to have the present in, for, to have the present form with this get or if you try to uh, inflect as the perfect imperfect form, you fail. So as you can see in seventeen, this get is just invariable, morphosyntactically. So again, what you have here is non-verbal, but say-like pronunciation with the combination of C, K, and the interpretation marking evidentiality. So for this type of evidential markers, namely C plus C type, I suggest they are also in the intermediate stage in question 5.2, where the bare root say is present without V. Here, I suggest the combination of the root say uh, here and the C head is morphosyntactically realized uh, as one element, for example, by with fusion. So phonologically, the say root here contributes the this part in this case. Here I assume the K part in this case is a regular standard complementizer in the language. But crucially, both heads, the root say and the C head are syntactically present, even though these two heads are realized as one element. So if this analysis is on the right track, the difference between evidential markers that have come from the say speech verb and the ones that have come from the combination of say and C is that the root say is fused with covert C head in only in the latter case. Uh, sorry, overt C in the latter case, in the case of this case. But crucially, the root say is present in both cases. And this root say contributes to their say like pronunciation and say like interpretation, namely hearsay evidentiality. Notice that due to the lack of V, neither kind of evidential is verbal any longer, like I said, despite their etymology, namely both have developed from the speech verb. Still, they are also phonologically and semantically distinct from unmarked complementizers because the root say keeps its original phonological and semantic information, at least partially. Before proceeding, let's consider how the change from speech verbs to this kind of complementizer happens. Uh, let's take this again an example and suppose language acquirers are exposed to the uh, following utterance 19, which is schematically shown in English. So Pro says that John is smart. So the phonological string would be says that John is smart. So this phonological string is ambiguous to acquirers in that they can in principle postulate two possible syntactic structure, structures to parse the string in 19. So 20A has the same structure as the one intended by adults. So the regular embedding structure. And 20B can also yield the same phonological string with the fusion of the C head, the C root, yielding says that structure. So it says that sequence. Here, the option B involves less structure, so it's preferred. Then uh, relevant reanalysis happens. But it should be noted, this is too simplistic. For example, it's well known that phonological reduction and or semantic bleaching facilitate grammaticalization in general, which is actually the case for this case. And like I said, frequency might play a role here too. That was the case of evidentials. Okay. In addition to the evidential markers, I suggest that operators which induce indicascal shift are in the intermediate stage in question where the root say is present without the verbalizer. So what's indicascal shift? So indicascals are items whose interpretation depends on the context, like I here and now. So if I say I, that refers to me, Hirosaito, but if you say I, I refers to you. So the interpretation depends on the context. And Kaplan conjectures in the obligatory refer to the actual context, even when embedded. 
But despite this conjecture, recent studies have shown that some languages have indexical shift, whereby an indexical expression is interpreted with respect to a non-actual context. So to schematically illustrate index, indexical shift, let's consider 21. In languages like without indexical shift regarding person pronouns, like English, uh, the indexical I here, John said that I am a hero, this I, I must refer to the actual speaker of 21. So if I say John said that I am a hero, I refers to me, Hiro Saito. You can't refer to the reported speaker, John, here. So this follows Kaplan's conjecture. I must be interpreted with respect to the actual context. However, in language with such indexical shift, like Amharic, the indexical I can refer to the reported speaker when truly embedded, even in the indirect quotations. So here, uh, John said that I'm a hero. This I can refer to John in languages with indexical shift. To explain indexical shift, Anand and Nevins and Anand, among many others, argue for the existence of an operator which licenses indexical shift in its syntactic domain. This operator is sometimes called a monster. So and in 22, the embedded CP is in the domain of the operator here. Oops, sorry. Okay. And the elements index calls within this CP can get a shifted interpretation. They can be in interpreted with respect to a non-actual context. So what's important for us here is that in many languages, complementizers which have developed from speech verbs are necessary for indexical shift. So this special complementizer is referred to as a say complementizer in the literature. However, this important observation has remained unexplained in the literature because in 22, it is the operator, not the C head, which is pronounced say, that has been assumed to work as a context shifter. Therefore, the relation between say complementizers and indexical shift has not been clear. So again, if you look at 22, the operator is located immediately above the embedded CP. In other words, the operator takes a CP complement. Given this, I suggest 22 should be reinterpreted as 23, where the operator in question is in fact the say root without V. So here, the root say retains its syntactic selection property in that it selects a CP complement. With this approach, we can capture why say complementizers are necessary for index scale shift. So if the root say is fused with the null C head, like this case, the combination of these two heads, namely the root say and null C is realized as one element, which I argue is what has been called say complementizer in, complementizer in the literature. Under the current analysis, it is the root say that works as an operator which induces index call shift and contributes to the pronunciation say. Thus, index call shift needs root say, which also has the phonological information of say. Notice that the root say here is not completely semantically bleached. I suggest the root say here at least encodes information of the attitude holder or the perspectival pivot and the relations between contexts. So just like the operator in Anand and Nevins and Anand, the root say signals that index items in its syntactic, syntactic domain are interpreted with respect to a non-actual context where the speaker or the author is the attitude holder of the matrix predicate. Therefore, like the cases of evidentials, we here observe non-verbal items which have a say like pronunciation and interpretation, namely belonging to the stage two. Notice here that the root say, not a speech verb, that's the combination of the root say plus V, licenses index shift. In other words, V 
is not necessary to induce index scale shift. We may thus expect to find a case where an index scale shift occurs without a true verb of saying. This is, seems to be actually the case in Dani, a Papuan language. The purpose clauses are introduced by something which I cannot pronounce, Yilvuk. <laughs> uh, this is the form of grammatical, sorry, the grammaticalized form of speech verb. And in this type of purpose clause, index scale shift is possible actually, as you can see in 24. So in 24, the null subject is embedded. And this null subject refers to the matrix subject. This is third person. But this embedded first, a third person subject controls the first person agreement on the embedded verb Q. To sum up, I have argued that there are elements in the intermediate, intermediate stage 5-2. So that's a nonverbal item that still have a say-like pronunciation and interpretation. In particular, I looked at hearsay evidentials which have developed from say and index cost shift operators, say complementizers in the literature. The existence of these items is captured under the proposed analysis where a grammaticalization of speech verbs involves decategorization, namely the loss of the verbalizer layer. Finally, let's look at briefly the last stage of grammaticalization. So this is the stage where the original speech verb or the root state is reanalyzed as an unmarked complementizer. So as we already seen, Taiwanese Kong is such a case. Kong can co-occur with the matrix predicate think and actually, Kong can co-occur with a wide range of predicates, including very clever that or possible that. So it seems that complementizer Kong is now a marked one in the, in the language Taiwanese. Here, the original semantics of the root say is completely bleached with this use, root say being reanalyzed as a C head. This differs from the case of say complementizers that induce index scale shift. And actually, say complementers of this kind are the most common grammaticalized form of speech verbs. They are reported in a number of unrelated languages, in just include Buru, Yorba, Nepali, Telugu, Chinese, Thai, and more. Just adding another example, Fene in Buru is uh, originally a speech verb. It can work as a complementizer too. So Fene here co-occurs with the matrix verb say. And finally, let's look at the, how the relevant change happens. It has been reported that the grammaticalization from C to C is often found in language with serial verb constructions. And suppose that language acquirers are exposed to a phonological string involving a serial verb constructions whose second member is C, like 27, where, again, I'm using English words, John tells C, then you have embedded CP. And suppose the structure of a serial verb construction is 28, where you have two VP, then you have sort of a larger little V layer. Even though I'm sort of putting aside the exact analysis here. Okay. And if language acquirers are exposed to 27, there are alternative structures to parse this string. In other words, 27 is ambiguous for acquirers. So uh, 28A is sort of the original input. And to, in 20B, the verb say is reanalyzed as a bare root, which takes a closer complement. Let's first think about the change from a speech verbs to a complementizer. If acquirers prefer the simpler structure, when they are exposed to an ambiguous input, they'll choose 28C over A because the former is simpler. In 20B, the verb say is reanalyzed as the bare root say. The current analysis also predicts the stage 28B where the bare root say is present, namely the change from A to B, as B involves less structure than 28A. 
This is the case of the index curl shift operators above. The root C is located between the embedded CP and the matrix page predicate. Okay, to sum up, I have investigated the three stages, namely the stages 5.1 through 5.3, most importantly, investigating hearsay evidentials that have come from speech proofs to and index cost shift operators, I have argued for the existence of this intermediate stage. To conclude the presentation, investigating grammaticalization of speech proofs, I have proposed the grammaticalization in question involves decategorization of say, the loss of the verbalizer layer. I have shown that this proposal predicts an intermediate stage where the bay root say is present. And this stage is not easily captured under other analysis. I have argued that this stage indeed exists by showing that there are nonverbal items which still have a say-like pronunciation and interpretation. Specifically, I looked at evidentials and operators that induce in the scale shift. There are many things to be done. Uh, in this presentation, I have assumed that the change and reanalysis are motivated by simplicity. But like I said before, there may well be other factors as well. Also, I was putting aside the exact content of the say root or the semantics and phonology of the root in general, which needs to be formalized. For example, the meaning of hearsay evidentially usually differs from that of regular speech verbs. So it seems additional semantic reanalysis is going on here. Finally, the last point concerns a claim of grammaticalization. The current analysis predicts an intermediate stage of grammaticalization, which major generative analysis don't. More generally, the proposed analysis predicts more fine-grained stages of grammaticalization. This may enable us to capture an important observation in traditional linguistics, that there is a cline of grammaticalization. Cline is a pathway along which grammaticalization proceeds. So in many cases of grammaticalization, there are multiple stages of change. So the decategorization analysis may provide a new tool to investigate such fine-grained stages in the framework of generative grammar. And I think that's it. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Hiroki. Uh, we have already some questions. Uh, so mm -hmm. let me uh, introduce, like the first question is from uh, Tommy Lee from University of Southern California. Mm -hmm. Uh, they may want to refer to your slides. So if you sure. feel like, uh, you can uh, keep your slides okay. uh, shared. Yeah. Give me a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for, uh, very much for the talk. So I have one, I may have two, but I would just ask the first one. Mm -hmm. So um, in your proposal, would you predict that for every language that is, I mean, that shows that the, the safe verb is in its third stage, will exhibit like a state at the second stage in the previous, um, like done chronically, like perhaps like some years ago, there must be like a intermediate stage that you're proposing. So would that be like for, like you, you predict like the, there's mm -hmm. a, stage, right? Is that- yeah, Not necessarily actually. So if you compare the first stage and third stage, so first, uh, maybe I'm gonna, I should show the slide first, uh, let's see. So what I'm arguing is that there can be the intermediate stage. So if you, yes. So if the phonological string uh, provided to language aquarius have the structure 5.1 and it's ambiguous for 5.1 and 3 as well as 2, they can just jump onto the last stage too, as long as the phonological string is ambiguous in terms of syntactic parsing. 
I see. I th then I think my question will be like, is that really like one, two, three step or like one to A and one to B? Like kind of like I concern the path of the grammaticalization. I see, I see, I see. Yeah. The system, so I didn't sort of put any restrictions on the path. So logically speaking, so there could be one, two, two change, one, two, 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 three change and one, two, three change as well. Yeah, and presumably like two to three. three yes, right. it, exactly. Three, right. yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. The next question is from uh, Satoshi Tomioka, University of Delaware. Hello. Um, okay. uh, uh, very interesting. So I'm actually interested in uh, say three as well. Mm -hmm. So I, it seems to me like a three, we, we can, one can easily imagine that there are m many stages within three where say, the meaning of say is still somehow active. Uh -huh. Therefore, it's this type of the complement as that is only compatible with something like verb itself has saying, but less so things like forget, remember, or uh, believe, or what in the no, for instance, the mental verbs. Would that be a reasonable kind of assumption? The, the, the stages where you said the Taiwanese con actually now is that it's possible that that can be con. So it's, it seems like a really bleached out, but I can imagine that there's a mini stages within the stage three. I, I think so. I think so. Yes, that would be the case too. Then to capture that, maybe I would need sort of more fine graded C layers. So, yeah. So in, in other words, is that, is that so? Yeah, where, do, where does that, that selectional property kind of um, reside? So that, that's a question, right? So for instance, I can imagine that this type of complementizer is not really about things like declarative versus interrogative, right. for instance. Right. The ask, for instance, can be compatible with saying, but perhaps, perhaps no isn't, right? So mm -hmm. in a sense that we, we may actually find a very strange partition of the kind of predicate that is compatible, say, see, um, not something that you could expect from the typical distribution of complementizers. That's true, that's true. I don't have a good answer, actually. But so the general pattern is grammaticalized say as a complementizer works as sort of a complementizer for declaratives in many languages. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is not a uh, say complementizer, but there is a case where a proposition becomes a complementizer and, and syntax, original syntax selection play, seems to play a role in an interesting way here. So in this language, I think that was Creole language. And this special P driven complementizer is used for factive clauses. So it seems like so nominal selection property is somehow remained in that case. Well, I mean, I, I know I'm not answering to your question directly, but I feel like syntactic selection property does play a role, but I haven't been able to formalize how. Yeah, so I'm particularly interested if someone knows the, the history of Taiwanese, is there an intermediate stage where con was only compatible with something like, a, like utterance verbs, but somehow there's a stage, like a final stage where it has become like a really, see, like a truly complementizer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, a, but or the switch was almost immediate. So I'm interested in, in the kind of the, your, your assumption about once you switch to say three, it mm -hmm. becomes all general. Or is there any kind of remnant or meaning of say still remaining even as a C head? So that's, I think that's the kind of the- I see, I see. Yeah. Well, I would like to allow that possibility, but in terms of the semantics of the root original root say, I need to find a way to formalize that. Yeah. Now, speaking of the Kong guy in Taiwanese, it's really weird, interesting, as Kong has a, really a bunch of uses here. So actually Kong can work as a topic marker as well. Mm -hmm. And it can be used as sort of an interjection as well. Mm -hmm. And I feel like even with that uses, the original semantics of say is somehow retained, right? Because 
speech verbs can mark topicality as well, like speaking of mm -hmm. this, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not sure if I can cover with all of these uses, but yes, I do agree with you that there are more stages even within the stage three. Yes, thank you. Uh, the, probably the last question in this uh, main session uh, will be by uh, Tomoyuki Yoshida, International Christian University. Okay. okay. Thank you. It was a good talk. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, I just wonder uh, if uh, non speech verbs can go through this kind of change as well. So uh, in the case of Japanese, for example, toyu uh, uasa, toita uasa, that's the kind of thing that you talked about. Um, I thought about uh, things like toshita uh, handan or toshita kette, tosuru kette. Prime Minister Suga likes this koshita, soshita rather than koyu, soyu. Uh, so, uh, um, is it possible to extend your analysis to uh, do kind of the, the verb do or seemingly do shita, suru? Uh, that's one. And then, uh, so shita, ko shita is, is sounds okay. Uh, but so suru, ko suru is it, it, not exactly the, the suru is still uh, claiming that the, the ori original meaning of do. So, uh, so through, you know, ko, kata wa versus so through, or ko suru kangai kata wa. Kind of, kind of weird. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a little bit off. So, so some kind of tense difference uh, is observed in the case of do, but it, it, it seems mm -hmm. to be a general meaning, wider, uh, vague meaning, and yeah. not uh, non speech uh, verb seemingly. What do you think about them? So, Fact-wise, in addition to do, in many languages, the verb go mm -hmm. has become a complementizer or at least can introduce a quote mm -hmm. in, in English as well, I think. And in, if I remember correctly, Arabic as well. And whether if I can extend my analysis to that cases, I'm not sure because the original semantics as an, let's say, agentive verb is not remained in a cleared way uh -huh. as it retains sort of as it obtains sort of a new method or new strategy to introduce a quote. So I have to say there is another semantic, not bleaching actually, semantic changes in the real analysis. So it could be possible in terms of the decategorization, but I have to say there's something more is going on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we will wrap up the session and then we will continue the discussion. We have a few more questions uh, that came in. Uh, so uh, we will do that. But let me, uh, before we finishing uh, the main uh, discussions, uh, let me thank the uh, course of this series, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshida and Professor Yoko Mizuda and also the two assistants, Yuki Baldoria Wu and Miyu Izuka. Uh, we also had the Liaison Institute of System Missionary Suzuki helping out. This event was supported by shared budget of ICU Research Institutes and Institute for Educational Research and Service, as well as the Linguistic Lab at ICU. Uh, the next uh, part of ICU Linguistic Colloquium will be on May 8th, and Rajesh Bhatt from University of Massachusetts Amherst and Michael Yoshitaka Orwin uh, from National University of Singapore will share the research, uh, research results. And the talks will be held from 10 a.m. JST. Uh, uh, it's also Saturday. Uh, from April 26, we also have a phonetic phonology talk series in collaboration with KO, KO University. Uh, it's a Monday, uh, so uh, we apologize for that, but uh, from 10 a.m. on April 26, Monday, Caitlin Smith from Johns Hopkins University and Amber Lacey Lubera and Ryan Walter Smith from University of Arizona will give presentations. Uh, please uh, refer to the website for more information. Uh, 
Uh, thank you all who participated in today's colloquium, and we hope to see you on April 26th or May 8th. Uh, the recording will now be started.